Genesis, the first 11 chapters, which is fundamental and foundational to the rest of the Bible. If you don't buy in, if you don't believe God for what He says in the first 11 chapters of Genesis, you're going to have a hard time believing Him in the rest of the Bible. So that's why I really focused the study on this, to try to help us get a handle and understand and be familiar with what God is teaching us and uh, leading us to know in the first 11 chapters. Jesus, every word He ever said is true. God the Father does not tell a lie. He is true. And the way to the Father is through the Son and Him only. So today we're looking at Genesis chapter 10. And uh, I'm actually going to back up just a hair into chapter 9 as we begin. But first, let's begin with prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word. And thank you, Lord, for the privilege to preach it, to share it, to proclaim the truth of your word, Heavenly Father, that, that we might understand it, that we might grasp it and be so familiar with it, Lord, that we see how it is employed through the rest of your word. The truth of your word is from cover to cover. And Father, we need to just adjust our own mindsets by faith to believe what you've said. And it's in Christ's name that we pray and all God's kids said, Amen. Amen. Is my mic on? Am I doing? Okay, I got it. Okay, I want to begin this morning by saying that our journey through this first 11 chapters of Genesis is now in the post-flood era. That's where we find ourselves. Following the departure from the Ark of, um, and the Noahic Covenant that we talked about last week, we, we get a snippet now here in chapter 9, the end of it, of Noah and his son, Shem, Ham, and Japheth at the end of the chapter in chapter 9. So let's pick up. I want to read those verses beginning in verse 18. It says, And the sons of Noah that went forth of the Ark were Shem and Ham and Japheth, and Ham is the father of Canaan. These are the three sons of Noah, and of them was the whole earth overspread. Noah began to be the husbandman, and he planted a vineyard. And he drank of the wine, and he was drunken, and he was uncovered within his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw his nakedness of his father, and told his two brothers, brethren without. And Shem and Japheth took a garment. <clears throat> and laid it upon their shoulders and went backward and covered the nakedness of their father and their faces were backward and they saw not their father's nakedness. And Noah awoke from his wine and he knew that his younger, what his younger son had done to him. And he said, Cursed be Canaan, the servant of servants, shall he be unto his brethren. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem and of Canaan, who shall be his servant. And God <clears throat> shall enlarge Japheth, and shall dwell, and he shall dwell in the tents of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. And Noah lived after the flood three hundred and fifty years, and all the days of Noah were nine hundred and fifty years, and as we saw previously in other chapters, and he died. Amen. Not amen that he died, but I mean that's the end. <laughs> well, the thing we want to briefly address in this text was not, was uh, in this text is why Noah cursed Canaan. And, you know, Ham did it, but he cursed Canaan. So I just want to address that briefly. First of all, there's much suggestion because of the Hebrew word we read in the King James, he, he has done unto him and there's a lot of, some debate that Ham may not have just looked, but may have done something more than just looking. Um, first of all, there's, uh, there's people who believe that, and others buy into it and say, no, he just saw him, and we're going to find out a little bit later why, what the attitude was of what Ham did. And uh, according to most scholars, Noah sees a problem in Ham's character. So I want to point this out. It's about Ham's character more so than what Ham did. He did what he did was not right, but it's his character about it. So, <clears throat> excuse me. We see a problem in his char Ham's character, and on the basis of that, he delivers Ham, Noah delivers a prophecy about the future descendants who will live in slavery 
to such things as this attitude of, of um, Ham's character, and who will then be slaves to their brother, their, both the brothers of Shem and Japheth. Like many things in the Bible, oftentimes we end up with more questions than we came to the table with. And this is not unusual. <coughs> Excuse me. But what I want to do, I didn't want to fly over that and not, not at least address that to some degree. So here we find this happening and the curse on Canaan, his son, Ham's son, because the attitude... The character of the father is also in the son. And Noah, however he did this, recognized that and put the curse on the son. Now following the death of Noah in chapter 9, we find, coming into 10, we find the table of nations. Now a lot of people say, oh, here we go with the genealogies again. And how many of you just love genealogies? <laughs> well, if Kelly was here, he would be the one to stand up and say, I like genealogies. He is a great researcher in genealogies. But most of us don't know these people, and we start rattling off these names, and, and it gets like okay and okay, and the son of, and the son of, and they begat, and, and we can go into Matthew and read the same thing. But just like there is a reason for a long genealogy at the book of Matthew, there's also a reason for the genealogy here in the table of nations. Now, I might mention that the, gospel, the uh, sorry, genealogies in Matthew is for the sake of showing the Jews that Jesus is the Messiah and has come from the line of David. He is the Lion of Judah. But here in the na table of nations, obviously, it's not speaking about that, but it's giving us insight into some people groups that got off the ark. And so these sons, and Noah and his wife and their wives, they got off the ark, and that's where we find ourselves. So the purpose of the nations rising here is that these, uh, we don't want to get bored with this. And I, 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 when I was uh, preparing this, I said, now, how can I do this and not bore anybody? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so the first thing that came to mind, well, I can do this little dance routine. I ruled that out immediately. <laughs> Uh, and I said, that's probably not going to work. Well, while it might not right now seem important, and it may just seem like it's just another list of names, it really plays in to the rest of the Bible. When we understand how these people groups separated into different places and, and um, <clears throat> some of the incidences that we just read about, we can get a better handle. We can actually understand the book of Daniel better. We can understand the prophetic book of the book of Revelation, which I'll be preaching on in a few weeks. And we can better pull the pieces of the Bible together and make them fit if we understand the table of nations. So the organization of the list of nations in 10 is genealogical, but genealogy is not its purpose. The genealogical listing is to show the relationships of the peoples one to another. You may draw a sigh of relief now because I'm not going to read 32 verses in chapter 10 of the genealogy. <clears throat> but here, let me give you the Cliff Notes version, if I may. So let's start with Japheth, because I cannot avoid getting into this chapter. Japheth is first. His sons are named, and then two of the two sons... Gomer and Javon, <clears throat> this list extends completely through the second generation and I'm sorry, partially into the third. So it goes into a little depth. And I'm not going to read all the names. But he was the father of the Indo-European peoples, those stretching from India to the shores of Western Europe. So kind of picture that map in your mind. And then Ham... Ham's line is addressed in verses 6 through 20. <clears throat> of his four sons, there uh, three are traced into the third generation, but one of Cush's sons is traced into the fourth generation. So it goes a little bit farther. And I was looking to get a drink of water, and I don't see my water bottle. <clears throat> Maybe, thank you, Maria, I appreciate that. So there are two expansions in the text here talking about Ham, 
And the two expansions deal with Ham's lineage, one regarding Nimrod. You know about Nimrod, don't you, Tower of Babel? We'll talk about that uh, next week. And uh, the other is about the territory of the Canaanites in chapter 10, verse 19. Ham's descendants <clears throat> divided some populated African, I'm sorry, Ham's, <laughs> Ham's descendants divided. Some populated the African area and others in the Far East. Excuse <clears throat> me, thank you very much. And then others settled on the east coast of the Mediterranean Sea. <clears throat> Predictively, the line relating to, uh, to these, this particular man, we, we got his family, and they didn't just stay in a clan. They split up, and they went different directions. When we come to Shem, his descendants are outlined in verse 21 through 31 of this chapter. <clears throat> of his five sons, only two traced into the third generation. Predictably, though, the line relating to Eber, you remember Eber, that name should stick. He was the forerunner of the Israelite nation. And then it is traced to the sixth generation. So there are two expanded statements there. First of all, one is about the earth being divided in the time of Peleg and the region occupied by the line of Jokotan. Not Joke but Jokotan, I should have said that pronounced a little better. Not that any of us have ever heard that name, right? <laughs> and then from Shem, Shem we get Elam, who was an ancestor of the Persian people, Ashur, who was the father of the Assyrians, Lud was the father of the Lydians, who lived for a time in Asia Minor, and Aram was the father of the Armenians, who also known as Syrians, and then Aphrahax, well, I didn't get that one right at all. <laughs> Afra Axid. Okay, if you can do better, you get with me after the service. <laughs> he was an ancestor of Abraham and the Hebrew people. The list of sons of Shem, Ham, and Japheth contains 70 names. And we should not think that that's an accident that it's written up that way. 70 stands for the totality. 70 stands for for it is a number of completion as we understand the number seven. The number 70 is identical to it. More important, the concept of 70 nations is offered as a design by God. God does all this. He puts it all together. Amen. Yet at the same time, the list is certainly not a complete list of the genealogy of Noah. His descendants and sons were far more uh, his uh, grandsons were far more than listed in this genealogy. So why is it that we get these three? And I think, honestly, that it's these three people groups, as they separate, that we start finding how people spread out all over the earth. Some propose the phrase in verse 32 that says, by those were the nations divided in the earth after the flood, it may refer to a division of human communities into farmers and nomads, but most Bible scholars traditionally address this and understand it as being the division of nations after the Tower of Babel. Let me also under, or remind you and make sure we understand that the Bible is not always written in a chronological form. Right. So when we talk about the, the separation of these three sons and their peoples into different geographical areas, we're kind of jumping ahead of how they got separated to begin with, and we'll be addressing that in chapter 11 next week. But the Bible doesn't try to put things in chronological order. It puts things in an order for a purpose. And right now what we're trying to understand is the division of these nations. So let me uh, say that there's three things that we can learn from this chapter. You know, even in a genealogy, even in the separation and the understanding of this, there's got to be a Bible lesson in here for us today. And I believe that I found a couple of things. First of all, we're talking about Noah and his family getting off the flood. Noah immediately gets off the flood, and what does he do? He offers sacrifice unto the Lord. And from that point on, it looks like people are quick to forget the one true God. 
You know, the, we understand that all the sinners, all the all those unsaved people, those mockers of God, died in the flood. But Noah and his family, and Noah being a God-fearing man, a righteous man, they knew about the one true God. And understandably, they worshiped the one true God. But when they get off the ark, and we start seeing these people multiply, it's like God's not in it. They've been blessed. They're now prosperous. The, for, the earth is bringing forth vineyards and, and uh, livestock are getting off and reproducing and God is blessing everything and yet they don't have any recognition of God at all in the, in the scriptures. <clears throat> Verses 1 through 32 can contain the phrase after the flood. And you would think after this cataclysmic event that people would get off the ark and start really being God-fearing people. But it looks like instead of that, they got caught up in the new world and they went their own way. Sometimes we can get caught up in our own world, can't we? And we get, we get sidetracked from the truth of God's Word. We get sidetracked from the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Now, I'm going to tell you, we are we are more to blame. We are. It's really our fault more than their fault when we look at the fact that when we get sidetracked from God, we're really, really saying we've really gotten sidetracked. Because they did not have the Holy Spirit dwelling in them, and we do. He is our comforter, but He's also our convictor. He, he leads us into all truth, and He tries to keep us on the straight and narrow. But when we decide to depart from that and not acknowledge or we forget the one true God in our life, we're worse than they are. Because we have a greater witness than they have. Amen. Here we have the table of nations with no hint of any of them following the one true God. It certainly is no different today. And as we look at our lives, we need to think really about all the wonderful things that God has done for us because we have the Holy Spirit. He is God in spirit. He is just, in fact, when we study the Trinity and we talk about Jesus and God the Father, we recognize that they not only have the same character and the same attitudes and the same heart, the Bible really teaches us that they are the same in essence. In other words, they got the same DNA. There's absolutely no difference in them, except they have different roles and different purposes. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. So people not only are quick to forget the one true God, but a second thing I see is they're quick to forget the oneness of the human race. Someone said, well, how many races are there? And I'm going to tell you, there's one. There's only one race. We have a lot of ethnicities. We have a lot of different people groups. And we talk about that next week in the Tower of Babel. But there's only one race, and it's human. The human race. Oh, I'm sorry. There's also the rat race. I forgot that one. Yeah. Okay, just the human race. There's one true and living God. And there's also one human race which he created in his image and we are all descendants we're all descendants of Adam but we're also all descendants of Noah and his three sons and I think that's fascinating to say that I'm kin to Noah you know I think that's cool Paul referred to this brotherhood of man in his sermon in Athens when he stated that God made from one Every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth. God made from one, from Noah. we all descendants of Him. If people would stop and really ponder this, it would put an end, it would, it would eliminate, it would dissolve prejudice in our world. If we all look back and said, well, you're my brother, you're my sister because of Noah. You know, we're all connected. And we all made in the image of God. So we don't need to forget about the oneness of the human race.
God made us all in his image, and we should reflect that image as Christians. And then thirdly, God wants all people to hear about the one means of a salvation. So we're, we're talking about one things here, one God, one true God, one human race, and one way to get to the Father, one way to have eternal life and go to heaven. Jesus in John 14, 6, you're familiar with this, I'm sure. He said, <clears throat> I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life, and no one comes to the Father but through me. Amen. Now I'm going to tell you, if anything puts all these other religions down, it's this one that says that there's only one way to get to heaven, and that's through Jesus Christ, the Son. So it's not, uh, I started to rattle off this other guy's name, but I can't even pronounce it now that I think about it. But it, it's not any other religion. Every other religion on the face of the earth, here's what it boils down to. How good are you? How do you perform? How do you maintain? How many works do you do? What sacrifices do you bring? But Christianity is totally different than that. It has nothing to do with what you do. You are the recipient. You are the benefactor of what Christ has done on the cross for you. And there's no other substitute. There's no lamb being cut. There's no goat being sacrificed or, or oxen being sacrificed. Jesus Christ is the only sacrifice that's acceptable to God because it's complete and it's sinless. And the only way for us to go to heaven is to put our faith in the work and sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And if we're not willing to do that, then we're not going to heaven. Because Jesus, God said, it's through His Son is the way. And it, it amazes me how other religions, and they really work hard and they're really earnest and sincere in what they believe. <clears throat> but it's so sad when you look at them. When I lived in Taiwan and I looked at the Buddhist community and I went to some of the, as a young man, I went to a young child, I went to a lot of Buddhist temples and stuff. I was just fascinated by the architecture. And I get in there and they're all doing the same thing and they're, they're doing like penance and they're, they're trying to suffer themselves to be good enough to go into eternal life. And they're all got all these incense and stuff and they're, they got all, I, I would call it a false liturgy, if you will, where they do all these things hoping that they're going to be accepted. Well, I'm telling you, all that you have to do to be accepted by God is accept His Son. That's it. That's it. There's only one way. Acts chapter 4 and verse 12 says, And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. And His name is Jesus. He is the Christ. He is the Messiah. He is the Savior of the world. You know, the thought came, maybe you're wondering, what about all those people that uh, those nations before Abraham, they, they never heard about Jesus Christ, never heard about the salvation through Him. Well, Paul answers that question in Acts chapter 14 in a, in a message to uh, a sermon at Lystra. And he says this, And in the generations gone by, parentheses, God permitted all nations to go their own ways. Listen, God is not going to force anybody to come to Him. He's going to give us an invitation. But they have gone their own ways, and yet he did not leave himself without a witness. He didn't say, okay, you're just on your own. I'm washing my hands. I'm done with you. What God said, if you want to do your own thing, I'm not going to stop you, but I'm giving you a witness so that you will know who the one true God is. He says, in that he did, he did good and gave you rains from heaven, and fruitful seasons, satisfying your heart with food and gladness. And in Acts 17, it says, God's witness was all around them. If men will seek Him, listen to this, if men will seek Him, He is not far from each one of us. Right. If we will just seek Him. You know, 
I believe with all my heart, based on Scripture, that inside of every person is a void. You know, some say, well, there's a hole there, or there's this. It's a void. And the only thing that will bring satisfaction in our lives completely is to allow God to fill that void. That's what we're missing when we're apart from God. <clears throat> you may say, well, I'm doing fine, or I'm prosperous and all. Well, that's well and fine. But what about the end of your life? What's it going to be like then? None of us know when we're going to pass away. But... In Christ, we know where we're going. Amen? We know who we're going to be with. And so it is encouraging. But like today, no one has an excuse for not accepting God's forgiveness. There is no excuse. You say, well, <clears throat> I went to that church, and that preacher did so and so, and I washed my hands of it, and I never went back. That's not an excuse. Amen? Well, actually, it is kind of an excuse. It's not a reason. It's not justified. Hebrews 12.1 says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witness, that's the prophets, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles or besets us, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let me... Let me dissect that just a little bit if I can. Since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witness, <clears throat> God has left that witness with us today. It's in the stars. It's in the earth. It's in us who are the mouthpiece of Jesus Christ on the earth today. We are the witnesses. And he's saying... Since we're surrounded by such witness, let us do something about it. Let us throw off or get rid of or put aside everything that hinders us from and, and entangles us. What are those things? Those are things of the world. Those are things of earthly and fleshly desires. Let's put them away, he's saying. You can look and see the handiwork of God in all creation. You can hear about the glory and the presence of God in the lives of Christians. And let's look at that and let's make a decision to put these earthly things aside that keep us from walking close with God. Amen. Television, movies, sports, hunting and fishing. I had to throw that in, Tommy. <laughs> Golf, anything that takes and demands our time, work, careers, family, all right? God first, family is second, and then the church. And I'm going to tell you that we can get so consumed with these different things that... <clears throat> We get sidetracked, really, from what our mission and our purpose is here today. We look at the table of the nations and we read about the history of that and how they spread apart. And, and what it really comes down to is what about us? Where are we at today and what are we doing? We must come to Christ and repent of our sins and receive His forgiveness in order to have eternal life. Bottom line then we're responsible to tell others. Amen? I conducted a class. It was on a Sunday night years ago. and <clears throat> I had about 25 in the class. And uh, I said, I want to ask a question, but I don't want you to answer. I don't want you to raise your hand. I don't want you to make a funny face or anything like that. I just want to ask a question. Because you're a witness, because you're carrying the message of the gospel, how many people in your lifetime as a Christian have you led to Christ? That's a deep question. And although some of us may sit and think, you know, and I've had people tell me this, I, I have never led anybody to Christ. And other people say, well, I've led a, a lot of people to Christ because I share the gospel and, and I ask them. <clears throat> but you know, one day we're going to stand 
accountable for every idle word we've ever spoke. We're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. That's a judgment where all believers will be. It's not the great white throne judgment later in the book of Revelation where the wicked dead are raised from the dead and judged and cast into the lake of fire. So this is a judgment of our works, what we've done in the body for the cause of Christ while we were here, and Christ has entrusted us with the message. So I want you to, I want you to get a handle on that. <coughs> One day, when I die, I'm going to heaven, but there's going to be a judgment. There's going to be what we call a marriage supper of the Lamb. And we're all going to be there as believers. And when I say marriage supper, don't start licking your chops and thinking fried chicken. That's not what we're talking about. But it's coming together and supping with the Lord. And God said <clears throat> that He is going to judge our works. What we've done in the body for the cause of Christ. So that makes me think right now, what have I done? What am I doing? What more can I do? <clears throat> because one day, I'm going to have, it's going to all be revealed. And I am going to receive rewards based on the works. Now I'm already in heaven, so don't misunderstand me. We're already in heaven. But I'm going to receive an additional bonus check, if you will, or rewards from God based on what I did in the body. But let me draw a flip side of that. <clears throat> there may be rewards that God has in His hand to give me and says, but I can't give you these because you didn't do this when I called you to do it. You, you were satisfied with going to church and sitting on a pew and singing and, and worshiping me, but that's what you did. And so these rewards you don't get because you wouldn't give it all. You wouldn't get in with your life and not just be a spectator as a Christian, but you're a participant in the works of God on this earth. I guess I got a little off base, didn't I, from Table of Nations. But you get the point. And I think the message here today is for us, as a people who are descendants of Noah, who have been spread out and find ourselves in this particular place at this time, that we have a mission and a purpose in Jesus Christ, and it is for the sake of the lost, which we all were at one time. Today, is a day of salvation, but it's also the day that we make our hearts and minds up that we're going to be the hands and feet of Jesus in our communities, in our families, and with our acquaintances. And we're going to do something more than what we've done for Jesus. Because there's a day coming, and let me say this, <clears throat> every year it's closer. Every year it's closer. Ten years from now, some of us will not be here. We won't be here. We'll be in heaven. I mean, just facts of life. Twenty years, even less. Fifty years from now, none of us will be here. And if the Lord tarries, it will be another generation coming in. And there will be another person standing here saying, we need to do what we can do now because we're going to give an account for it. We're going to receive or not receive rewards based on what we do in the body for Christ Jesus today.